Hello everyone. We are now in the Hebrew month of Tishri. I'm going to teach to you today about a little bit about the Hebrew month of Tishri and also about the fact that it's also the Hebrew New Year. So let me get right into it. So we are now currently in the Hebrew month of Tishri and we are also celebrating the new Hebrew year. This is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar and it is a special time not only for the Jewish people but also for Christians. We're going to look into the prophetic meaning of this new Hebrew year along with the Hebrew characters that are linked to this month and the new Hebrew year. Now you may ask, why is the new Hebrew year celebrated in the seventh month and not on the first month? Okay, well, I'm going to give you some background to this. In Jewish tradition, it is said that the Tishri, that Tishri, the Hebrew month of Tishri, commemorates the creation of the world, also known as the head of the year. It's the celebration of the beginning of all that God has created. So that explains why it's done in the seventh month, not like January 1st, which is the first month of the Gregorian calendar. So the Jewish people believe that the Hebrew month of Tishri, the seventh month, is the commemoration of the creation of the world. So, uh, this, so the Hebrew calendar, calendar is unique to other ancient calendars in that it is that it has its own way of marking out time, not just by months, but also by festivals and feasts. Seven, to be exact, there's seven different feasts that go on throughout the Hebraic year. Uh, there is the Passover, which starts in the first month of Nisan, and also the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then the, the, the Feast of First Fruits, then the Feast of Weeks, and then the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and lastly, the Feast of Tabernacles. These are very important feasts, uh, and they all, one way or another, point to Jesus and to his redemptive plan for mankind. And it's awesome. It's very interesting stuff. It's interesting to know that Judaism has several different new years also. It's not like in a Gregorian calendar and in our society, we celebrate New Year's once on January 1st to mark off the new Gregorian year. Uh, the Jewish, uh, the, the um, Jewish people celebrate several new years for different reasons. In Judaism, Nisan 1 is the new year for the purpose of counting the reign of kings and the months in the calendar. So Nisan is the first month of the Hebrew calendar, and that's how they start things off, and that, like, the reign of the kings. And also in uh, Elul 1 in August is the new year for the tithing of animals. This was back in the Old Testament, obviously not for today. Uh, Shabbat 15, the 15th of Shabbat in February, is the new year for trees. This determines when first fruits can be eaten. And then Tishri, the first uh, Tishri, the first Tishri, is Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year for uh, new year for years, new year for years. <laughs> okay, interesting, right? Tishri, being the seventh month of the Hebrew character, speaks a lot about the number seven. So it is interesting that it's the seventh month. Uh, seven. Uh, there was a lot of symbolism attached to that. For example, the seventh day on the seventh day, God rested and He set it apart and called it holy because that's when He finished creating the earth. So it was a day of completion uh, and fulfillment. He fulfilled his desire to create the world. So setting the stars in place and everything like that, setting the universe and creating planet earth and all the other heavenly bodies out there, all the other planets. So on the seventh day, he completed that. So it's very important. So God rested. He set it apart, called it holy. God also commanded the Israelites to rest as he did on the seventh day, known as the Sabbath. It represents completion and fulfillment, just to name a few things. That's just a few things of, of what's the symbolism of what the, the number seven represents. So Tishri being the head of the year celebrates the new Hebrew year 5783. So we're going to go into a little bit about the Hebrew characters of the year 5783, the last two characters, uh, particularly the eight and the three. Those two characters are a pay and a gimel. The Hebrew alphabet, as I've mentioned in past teachings, the Hebrew alphabet is a, a pictorial, it's a pictorial script. 
Each character is a picture of something that has multi layers of prophetic meaning. The pay, for instance, is a picture of an open mouth. So I'm going to show you a picture. Um, it's a picture of an open mouth here. That's this is the original primitive version of it. It was just like a an, it's showing like a mouth being open, and it eventually became to, came to look like this, which is supposed to symbolize the side profile of a face with its mouth open. This is the pay. So it started out looking like this, just a mouth, and then goes into this. Now pay means the the the, the character pay. Uh, means things regarding the face and the mouth. So um, the pay, for instance, is a picture of an open mouth from an ancient form and is the picture of a face with an open mouth in the modern form. This, the meaning is, is to open, to blow like a mouth, and uh, to scatter, and also the word edge. Well, edge in regards to like the edge of your lips, when your lips are forming something, where the lips open up and form different, words like I'm doing right now. So the edge of the lips form uh, different sounds that refers to speaking, opening your mouth to utter something. With regards to edge, it is about forming the words to utter specific sounds. Sound is important in scripture, very important in scripture, especially the good kind of sound. In the beginning, God said or spoke, he formed specific sounds that created light, life, and order. Amen. By his mouth, he set the boundaries of the seas. After he spoke, let us create man in our image and likeness. He then blew into man the breath of life. <coughs> Excuse me. The meaning to scatter can be likened to the parable of the sower of the seeds, who, who sowed, who scattered seed on different types and kinds of ground, which represent the different types and conditions of the heart of mankind. The seed he scattered is the words of life that were spoken. Awesome, right? So pay is a prophetic Hebrew character. Prophetic, to, prophetic is to speak forth words about the future. Being prophetic when you're speaking, being prophetic means you're speaking forth something. You're speaking something about the future or you're speaking something to someone at that moment that reveals something hidden inside their heart that uh, is comforting and reassuring to them. It's speaking something that they've already heard inside them. It's a confirmation of what's already going on inside them that God's already speaking inwardly. Prophetic is speaking it outwardly, so it's heard outside of you. That's being prophetic. Uh, it's also meant to comfort you and to build you up. The pay character resembling a side profile of a face with its mouth open speaks of identity. We recognize or identify a person by their face and also their unique voice, their sound, their pay sound their sound and their speech. We must understand that we are made in the image of God and that what we say and how we talk has an impact on ourselves and those around us. Amen. We can either speak positive, faith-filled words, uh, things, or negative, doubt-filled things. We can either speak healing or abusive things. Amen. With regards to pay resembling a face, the Psalms speak of seeking the face of God. It also refers to his presence. When we're seeking the face of God, we're seeking his presence. And it is so important, not just for this Hebraic year, but for our overall spiritual life as well, to do that, to seek his face, to seek his presence on a daily basis. Because when we seek his face, we can hear him speak. He can pay to us. <laughs> he can blow upon us. He can scatter his words inside our hearts. He can to speak things into us, to build us up and to strengthen us. Amen? So when you're seeking the face of God, you're seeking his presence. This speaks of intimacy with him. And as he meets with you, transformation can happen. Amen? The Gospel of John speaks of this in multiple layers. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And what is the Word? Who is the Word? It's Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Word. He is the spoken word and he is the word living word living and active word it's jesus he is the word the embody the embodiment of the word that not only speaks but was seen is seen and is alive when john the baptist said behold the lamb of god he was saying hey look see there he is jesus said when you've seen me you've seen the father and in verse 14 of john chapter 1 it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us 
and we saw his glory, the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Anyone who came in contact with Jesus was never the same. Amen. Even to this very day, anyone who experiences Jesus is never the same, and that is true. I've experienced Jesus more than once throughout my Christian walk, and I've never been the same afterwards. And I mean that in a very good way, <laughs> in a blessed way, in a healed way, in a strengthened way, in a faith-filled way. Amen. So that's just some of the layers of the character, Hebrew character Pei. The next character is the Gimel, and I'll show you what the Gimel looks like from the, the original form to the modern form. So what we have here, up here, starts out looking like this. This could look like a foot, and then this eventually looks like a hump, and then it goes into a character that looks like this, and this is the modern form, and it could look like a camel walking. This is what Gimel actually means camel or gamal in hebrew so i'm going to go into that a little bit but that's the hebrew character gimel so they added like a camel onto that and that that, that there's a whole lot of meaning to the hebrew character of, of gimel that i'm going to go right into so gimel means to carry walk and gather it's the picture of a camel walking which i just showed you now the hebrew word for camel is gamal which means to deal out to deal bountifully with, or recompense, or repay, or requite, which is very interesting. You can see a visual of a person riding a camel, carrying the recompense or, or repayment on its back, and it can also represent a season of being uh, dealt with bountifully. So this this is in regards to now we so we uh, regarding to this new Hebrew year of five seven eight three. Uh, yes, five seven eight three. So now. The emphasis in this particular year is regarding uh, seeking God's face, which I just spoke to you about with the Hebrew character Pei. So uh, in this season, we must, uh, in this new year, this new Hebrew year, not that we must, it's, it's recommended. I urge you, encourage you to seek God's face, to see what God wants to do. And for what reason? It's coming into the Gimel. So what the Gimel uh, represents. So we're, we're in this season, we can seek God's face for what the camels are bringing in. Amen. So the camel represents carrying something in, carrying in recompense, carrying in a repayment, carrying in something that's dealing bountifully with us on our behalf. Speaks of a season of recovery of that which was once lost. So this is the season of seeking God's face for those things that we once lost. That either we lost or the enemy stole. Both, actually. It could be what what the enemy stole from us and what we lost in the process over however many years. So recompense typically means to be compensated for damages done or losses recovered. That implies what the enemy has done to us. He has damaged us. He's stolen from us. And this is the year where where we can seek God for that recompense, for what for that which was lost and stolen from us. Amen. So it can be recovered this year. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so this is an exciting year. Gimel also means to gather. So the definition of gathering brings the scripture of to me of the feeding of the 5,000. That's, that's what came to mind in, in John chapter 6. When after everyone had eaten their fill, Jesus told the disciples to gather up the fragments so that none were lost and wasted. And also the scripture from Joel, when God said he would restore the years that the locust and the worm and the canker worm have eaten away. So these things speak of how God always is aware. He's always aware of what has gone on in our lives. All the details, gathering up the fragments that none may be lost or wasted. All the fragments, all the things that have happened to us. There's parts of our lives that have been fragmented due to being, us being chewed up and spit out or consumed by something. Somehow the enemy may have consumed us. You know, the Bible says that he walks around, he walks around like a, like a lion seeking to whom he may devour or consume. So he can consume us with all kinds of things. We can get distracted from things, pulled out of the will of God, pulled into a different direction. That's what that talking, being, talking about being consumed is about. We can get consumed with grief. We can get consumed with rejection or whatever it may be consumed with um, whatever loss, whatever grief, 
whatever troubling thing may have happened. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but fear not, for I've overcome the world. So whatever may happen to you, Jesus has overcome it and he will restore it back to you, that which has been lost and stolen. Whatever the enemy has consumed and devoured, God's going to restore. Amen? And the enemy's going to have to pay it back. So that's what this year is about, this new year. So let me read to you. So that God is always aware of what goes on in our lives when things become devoured and consumed and fragments are left to be discarded as if worth nothing. Sometimes in our lives we feel that way, like what was once a blessing is consumed by sorrow and grief and loss. But God sees what happens in our life and wants to restore what the enemy has stolen or we ourselves have lost due to maybe a sin we've committed. Whatever it may be, there is forgiveness. Amen. This is the year when God wants to restore. That's the exciting thing about this year, this 5783. This is the year when God wants to restore things back. This is a time when we can war for that which um, was stolen and lost and war for, for recompense, for things to be restored back. So in this new Hebrew year, much ex expectation is attached to it. So there's two parts to this year. There's the pay part and the gimel part. The first part is to seek his face and be on the alert, listening to the spirit for the, for the announcement of the second part, which is the gimel part for the arrival of the spiritual and natural camels coming into the camels. So we can be on the lookout for the gimels <laughs> in our lives. Whatever that gimel may be, whatever that restoration may be, you know there's things that you've lost in your life that you're asking God to restore. This is the year for God to bring that to pass. Amen. This is the year to have that expectation of faith and start the beginning process. Maybe that's all, maybe all it is, is the beginning process of restoration. Sometimes rest, we may think restoration is boom, it's done, it's here all, all at once, but not necessarily. It could be the beginning of a restoration process, a beginning of restoring back what was once lost. Amen. So this is the arrival of the spiritual and natural camels coming with, with that which was once lost or stolen and is to be poured back onto us bountifully. Because that's, that's what the, the, the Hebrew meaning is for here, to be dealt with bountifully. See, it's the image of a camel coming with its back loaded with a bounty of that which was once stolen is now being restored. Amen? So this is the year where we can pray and seek God and say, hey, God, Whatever it is that you've got to do for me, do to me to get me prepared to come to that place where I, those things can be restored. Maybe sometimes restoration must take can only take place when our hearts are changed. You know that when we when we're in the when we seek the Lord, sometimes that's a tough thing for some of us to be seeking His face to become intimate with Him because some things that have lost that we've lost we have a hard time with God. But we can be honest with God. He already knows what's going on inside of us. So we can bring it before him and say, God, these things were lost at one time. This was lost. And I'm asking you to restore it. And you know what? I was angry with you about this and very disappointed. And I lost faith and I doubted. And I asked for forgiveness for those things. And I asked for you to bring healing to those areas. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, it says, he himself has borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. So that means that we can bring that stuff to him for him to bear it, for him to take it away, take it on off of us, take it off of us and take it on himself. That's that's one of the one of the reasons Jesus came was to to bear our sorrows and carry away our griefs. And our grief and sorrow can be all kinds of things, the loss of things, the loss of relationships. I mean, if someone passed away, it's the being restored after grief, going through the grief process properly. Sometimes we carry things inside of us for unresolved issues with people who have passed on. And God is the one who can bring restoration and healing in those areas and bring a bounty of healing, a bounty of restoration, a bounty of being able to move out of that place of grief. Sometimes we get frozen in time with grief in all kinds of mixed feelings. We get frozen there. You know, for some people, I've been through it myself, where all of a sudden you're you're in the middle of doing something. Next thing you know, bam, grief hits you right between the eyes and it just sidelines you. That's grief. Other people, it's just a sadness, a sorrow. 
and a sense of loss and a sense of emptiness and a sense, you know, you lost something because you did. You lost somebody who was a value, who had impact in your life. Sometimes it's a loss of someone who was abusive to you and you don't know what to do with those feelings. You know, you want to see justice in some way because of what that person did, may have done to you, whether it was neglect or abuse, whatever the, it may be. God wants to bring you to the place where you can overcome that. To, to restore you to the place where you can walk on from there. Amen. So this restoration can mean so many different things. God can be bringing not just a financial thing, if that's what it may be. It can be a mental and emotional restoration to, to help release you, to get you out of where you are. This past Sunday um, at a church we went to, um, the pastor talked about being uh, the breaking of a cycle. And what he spoke about was when Jesus met the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, what Jesus did was he broke all kinds of boundaries by doing this. For a Jewish man to talk to a woman was breaking a boundary, let alone it being a Samaritan woman. Because the Jews and the Samaritans, there was a lot of animosity between them because there was a mixture of the two, of Jews intermingling and intermarrying with the Samaritans. And the Samaritans weren't Jewish, they were, they were Gentile. So if you were a Samaritan, a Jewish Samaritan, you were neither, ex you were kind of rejected by both sides. You were this hybrid that had no place. You, you, had, you didn't fit in, you were a misfit. And being a woman Samaritan on top of it, this particular woman couldn't even, like they, Jesus met her in midday at the well. Now during those times, um, the women used to go to the well early in the morning before it got too hot so they could get get the water. But this woman couldn't because she had a major stigma on her, not just because she was a Samaritan, but because she was also married five times. Big stigma for back then. Still today, but really, like, you were, re you were rejected big time. There was a lot of shame on you back then for being married five times. And now the sixth time, she's not even married to the man she's with. She's just living with the guy. So it's like sin upon sin upon sin upon sin upon sin, plus you're a S Samaritan, plus you're a woman. So you got all these stigmas on you, all this reproach on you. This woman's carrying a lot of shame on her. And Jesus comes to her and he starts speaking to her. And she's like, what are you talking to me for? First of all, you're Jewish and you're a man. And it's the middle of the day. You you're not supposed to be doing this. And then Jesus says, give me a drink of water. And, you know, and then it, the story goes on where he says, please give me a drink of water. She's like, you know, uh, um, you know, the, uh, why are you talking to me for, you know, and he's like, and then he goes on to talk about how if I want to give you water that you will never thirst from again. And then, and then at the end of it, and he says, go and get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you said rightly, you've said truthfully, you've had five husbands and the sixth guy you're living with, the sixth guy you're with is, you're just living with him. You're not even married to him. And she's like, oh, you must be a prophet. So um, then through this whole conversation with her, he actually breaks her out of her cycle of, of shame and brings her to the place where she comes to realize that he's the Messiah and sets her free. And as she's broken out of that cycle, out of that whole rut that she's been in for so long, she actually experiences acceptance for the first time. She's experienced rejection for so long. She's lived as a rejected person. She's identified herself as a rejected person. She comes into a place of being, well, I've just been accepted by a Jewish man who's actually the Messiah. I was just, I've just found out that God has accepted me regardless of my past and what has happened to me. So some people have, are going through stuff like that where that cycle can be broken this year. This can be the year where those old cycles can be broken and you can be restored to the person, to the identity of who you truly are as a child of God, as a priest, as a king, as a son and a daughter of the Most High. This is what can happen this year for, for you if you're listening to this. 
Amen. So this is a very exciting Hebraic year for us to be positioned in faith, to be in the secret place, seeking his face and asking him to be how to be positioned in the place to be able to receive that which was lost or stolen. So let's prepare our hearts this year. Let's start it off right, preparing our hearts before him with an attitude of prayer and asking Lord and seeking his face and saying, Lord, what what is it that you want to restore back this year? What is it that you'd like to restore back in my life? I lift my heart up to you. I lift my, my soul up to you. I lift all my wounds, all my hurts. I lift every circumstance, everything that's out of my control that I cannot control. I lift my family to you that's lost. I lift them up to you, Lord, whatever it may be. Lift it up to him. Worship him and thank him for this brand new year and ask him to position and ready you to be able to receive. Amen. So in my next video, I will talk about just strictly about the month of Tishri itself uh, and its and its prophetic significance. But for now, let's celebrate this brand new year of 5783. This is the year of, of war. Some have said this is the year to war for our resources, to war for restoration. So warring means is taking taking a promise of God and saying, God, this is what you've said. Or maybe something God has spoken in your heart that He that you feel that He wants to do for you and say, Lord, I'm st st standing fast. Just like just like Ephesians six talks about stand fast with the shield of faith and the you know, with the full armor of God on, and having done all standing no matter what. So Father, I pray for each and every one who has heard this message today that you would bless them bless them and remind them that this is a year of restoration a year that can they can that you want to deal bountifully with them that you want to bring healing that you want to bring restoration that you want to bring a strength and a renewal that you want to break the old cycles you want to break us out of the old cycles and bring us into the new so we can come into an even even deeper place in you and overcome every obstacle everything uh, that the enemy has sought to devour and that that would be restored back. So we receive by faith every single thing that you desire to restore back to us, Lord. I pray for the breaking of addictions, for the breaking of, 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 of grief and the suffering of loss. I pray the breaking of rejection, of humiliation, of every trauma. We break off every trauma off every single person that's listening to this video. In the name of Jesus, the trauma be broken off that we can move on from trauma, that we can move on from rejection, we can uh, move on from, from shame, depression, anxiety, and fear. We can move on from all the lies of the enemy that's kept us ensnared for so long in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless.